The National Farmers Organization presents news coverage on NFO's national credit structure. United States low wheat price is hurting America, Canada, Australia, and Argentina growers. A look at the world wheat prices and what's new, including understanding parity, increased costs, why should farmers be second-class citizens, and farmers' responsibility. For more on these news stories, we now go to NFO News Analyst Bill Allen. We've always said that credit is not what we needed. What we needed was price, and that I wholeheartedly agree with and say tonight. But I want to see us come out of this convention with a credit structure system to protect every farmer that's a member of the NFO in this nation, whatever state he might be in. That was Orrin Lee Staley, president of the NFO, as he spoke at the National Convention at Omaha. The credit crisis facing farmers and ranchers was called to the attention of President Carter and Secretary of Agriculture Berglund last summer. Governor Exxon of Nebraska had reported that in 12 states that form the heartland of America, about one-fourth of all the farmers and ranchers would have to refinance or dispose of farm assets in order to meet payments. That's because prices were too low. Well, they stayed too low. And a Kansas University economist, Roy Laird, was quoted in the business magazine U.S. News and World Report that at least a third and possibly half the farmers in the whole country faced refinancing or bankruptcy. Secretary of Agriculture Berglund was aware of the problem and spoke about it at the NFO National Convention. He welcomed President Staley's blueprint for credit committees in the NFO. I have just recently issued a ruling down through the FHA. I said, stop all foreclosure actions. I don't want anybody chased out this winter. <laughs> now, I, I'm not authorized to grant a moratorium. I can't cancel debts. I can't cancel interest. But I can give time and terms and I've told the FHA people, renegotiate these loans, extend, defer, renew, do anything you need to do within the law, but don't foreclose. The government's supposed to lend money to people who need help. And I'm delighted that you're planning to organize a credit committee because we need that kind of good, sound farmer judgment in the administration of these programs. Here's Orrin Lee Staley's point-by-point -point description of the NFO credit plan. He said this at one of the young farmer and rancher see-for-yourself meetings at Corning, Iowa, home office of the NFO. Credit's not the answer. But if we're going to have farmers around ready for collective bargaining to succeed, they have to be able to stay in business. The county credit committee is then available to any member that wants to secure credit or isn't being able to get it. They'll go to the bank, the PCA, if the member requests it, as one member or as a committee. They'll work with the FHA if a loan is already there. I don't think there's any question, but what we can give them an absolute guarantee, there won't be any foreclosure. But the problem in the FHA has been the, the bureaucracy involved. It got a bad name because you never could get an answer. And Staley gives an example of one of the successes of the NFO credit committees. In Nebraska, we got the call the other day. The bank cut off 22 farmers. Three of them were NFO members. They went into FHA, made the application. They said it would be no use. They called the right people through the chain of command that we have set up. 48 hours later, the FHA local office called them back in and said, we'll take care of you. Today, we have brought you a summary of the NFO's action on the growing credit crunch facing farmers and ranchers. NFO emphasizes, in setting up credit committees, that credit is a private matter and should be treated as such. NFO also stresses the whole public stake in keeping families on the land and the land out of the hands of the corporations. Let us not forget that the Great Depression of the 1930s was preceded by farm foreclosures in the 1920s. At Wichita, Kansas recently, the National Wheat Growers Association heard an Australian, Sir Leslie Price, chairman of the Australian Wheat Board, urge that our United States government raise the price support on American wheat. 
Price said that while the United States has the only wheat surplus in the world, the American price is extremely low and is hurting not only American growers, but every grower in Canada, Australia, and Argentina. Then, he said, if Uncle Sam raised the price, the world price would increase. And then the Australian official said, surely it is much better for us to compete at a higher level. Actually, the Australian official is not the only voice from overseas urging Uncle Sam to raise the price of wheat. This is interesting because one of the main conventional reasons given for having cheap wheat is that we would lose our world markets if we let wheat supports go higher. That theory just doesn't square with what the foreign countries are saying and have been saying for years. For instance, in August of 1968, NFO reporter Don Mack interviewed a Belgian, Guido Knott, the Brussels correspondent for Agri-Europe and other publications. Knott said this. Farmers in one country or in one group of countries should not be the victims of the low price their colleagues, farmers, have in other countries. But these should try to have on both sides as high prices as is necessary to give a, a, a decent uh, standard of living for people on the farm. That was Guido Knott, Brussels correspondent. He's what journalists call an informed observer, and he explained how a higher American wheat price would work. But now for another example, here is Dr. Hans W. Stinshoff, agricultural attaché to the West German government. He discussed the same point in an interview with NFO News last summer in June of 1977. Our grain prices are roughly spoken about uh, 70, 80 percent higher than yours, but uh, dairy products are only slightly higher in price than yours, and there are a lot of uh, similar differences. But um, I repeat this, we have to uh, protect our farmers as you do yours, um, and since our farmers are much smaller and the general in income level in Germany is similar to your general income level, we have to give our farmers uh, higher prices so they can uh, make their profits, their profits. That was Dr. Hans W. Stinshoff, agricultural attaché to the West German government. Both he and the Belgian Guido Knotts said that their grain prices are higher than ours. So the question comes into sharper focus. Why would our government have a cheap grain policy on the excuse that we would lose our world markets if foreign spokesmen, both in the trade and in their governments, consistently say it would be helpful if we would stabilize our grain prices and even charge more? Robert G. Lewis, writing in the Farmers Union Marketing Letter last October, quoted our USDA as saying, we don't raise our wheat prices because foreign governments have not agreed to follow the United States lead. Then Lewis said this, quote, we have checked confidentially with both farm organizations and government officials in Canada, Australia, and Argentina, the main other exporters, and they declare convincingly that the U.S. government never asked or offered any such thing. They said they'd be glad to raise their price, but obviously can't do it on their own if the U.S. keeps the loan rate down. Perhaps the Australian official put it best when he addressed the Wheat Growers Association at Wichita. He said it would be better for wheat growers in all these countries if we competed at a higher price level. Our Department of Agriculture should do so. The chairman of the Australian Wheat Board, Sir Leslie Price, recently urged the United States to raise our wheat prices so that other wheat exporting nations could compete at a higher level. He said this would be more fair to the wheat farmers in the various countries. The Australian official is only one in a long line of informed people, both in and out of these governments overseas, who have been giving us this advice. We recently cited a Belgian journalist and a West German agricultural attaché who made the same point and then told us how much higher their wheat prices are than ours. But this isn't just a random sampling of foreign prices. Here's a whole long list compiled by the International Wheat Commission. Please note that what the wheat farmers get, as supported by their governments, ranges from $2.24 a bushel in Argentina, the lowest, to $10.90 a bushel in Japan, 
the highest on the list. The United States is second from the bottom. Our wheat prices are supported at 228 a bushel. We're going to read the whole list, starting from the lowest. Argentina, 224, United States, 228, Australia, 259, Pakistan, 272, New Zealand, 290, Canada, 295, United Kingdom, 310, India, 319, Egypt, 321, Ireland, 365, Syria, 371, South Africa, 372, Morocco, 382, France, 404, Italy, 409, Tunisia, 411, Greece, 421, Denmark gets 429 a bushel, Portugal, 442, Turkey, 446, Belgium, 450, Luxembourg, 450, Netherlands, 453, Spain, 463, Austria, 474, Sweden, 479, Israel, 484, West Germany, 497, and Brazil, $5.28 a bushel, Finland, 581, Korea, 649, Norway, 772, Switzerland, 1051, and Japan, the highest, at $10.90 a bushel for wheat. We simply don't have to maintain such a low price, as some people argue. They say we might lose our world markets. Not so, because the United States is the residual supplier. That means we still have wheat to export normally after the other suppliers have sold all their exportable wheat. We still have some. So therefore, we can name the price. It's like the Arabs and the oil. They can name the price of petroleum in the world, and they do. Harry Truman believed in high parity for agriculture. And during his administration, farmers realized 107 on the parity scale, partly due to the Korean War, and mostly because Truman, his administration, supported farm commodities at 90% of parity. But parity slipped steadily from one presidential administration to the other until now, farmers at around 65% of parity. Frank LaRue, the USDA sales manager back in the 60s who resigned in protest over this cheap food policy, traces the parity readings from Eisenhower's Ezra Taft Benson to the present time. We fell to 84% with Benson, went to 77 with Kennedy Johnson, we fell to 76 with Nixon, Ford went down to 73, and now we're at an all-new low. Never in 46 years, we're down to 60, we were down to 63 about a month ago, we're back up, back up to about 65, and so we're in the worst position we've ever been in, and parity formula is the real good proof of what's causing this problem today. Farmers wouldn't be striking if they didn't have their back to the walls and going broke. That was Frank LaRue, USDA official of the 1960s. When NFO President Orrin Lee Staley testified recently in Washington, he urged higher supports on wheat, which influences other commodities. You can get a copy of these world wheat prices by writing to NFO Radio Division. Week after week, they keep coming in busloads to Corning, Iowa, the home office of the NFO. The young farmers and ranchers are brought in by experienced NFO people in their area to see for themselves. We interview some of them, and of course a question that comes to mind is, what is the predicament, really, of a farmer whose crops are way below parity in price, like, say, in wheat? Here's Armand Renier of Sabetha, Kansas. I was in there uh, trying to buy a used uh, manure spreader from a local John Deere dealer, and uh, we got talking about parity, and he said he didn't know what parity meant. And I said, you don't? And he said, no. He said, do you? And I said, sure I do. I said, it means equal buying power at the marketplace. And I said, I'm at the marketplace right here. I said, I'm wanting to buy this manure spreader. And I said, uh, but I don't have equal buying power. And he wanted $1,100 just about for this used spreader. And I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just take it. But I said, you figure it up at 39% of parity, because I said, that's what I'm getting from my wheat. And so he run that across his calculator right away and come up with $427. And I said, I'll take it. I said, make out a check. And he said, oh, no, I couldn't sell it for that. I said, well, how do you think I'm going to stay in business out here on 240 acres, taking 39% of parity from my wheat? And his point was, he can't stay in business doing business that way. Well, that's for sure. Nobody really expects him to, do they? No, no, no way. So the surprising thing is that anybody would expect a farmer to. That's right. That's for sure. 
We also ask the young farmers about what the public doesn't understand about their situation that maybe even older farmers don't understand. Here's Glenn Dockhorn of Comstock, Nebraska. Remember when my granddad bought his first tractor, he bought a complete line of machinery for, and a tractor for $2,400. And uh, our repair bill is bigger than that on one tractor this year. And they don't realize these kind of things, the money that is involved in farming today as it was even 20 years ago. They they make things wonder, you know, or wonder, well, gee whiz, how come he can't make it on, I made a living on a quarter, why can't he make it on a section, you know? <laughs> So this, there's, there's, a, there's definitely a, a gap there that they, they haven't kept up with. Alan Straw, head of the NFO Hog Division, accurately describes a non-farmer's comment while they watched a recent farm strike tractor parade. And I'm down watching these tractors and all the rest of this, and I had one man tell me this. He says, yeah, he says, look at the cabs on there, and that one's got an air conditioner in it. And then he says, well, that one's got music in. He's got a stereo in it. And I says, I says, when you take those, those air conditioners out of those offices and you take that soft music out of those offices and those carpeting uh, floors and all that, then we'll take them out of the tractors. But until then, they'd better be on that. Because, boys, the bottom line is profit. And there is no reason that because we run a tractor over here across this land that we shouldn't make a profit. Absolutely none. And that's why I say 1978 is the year to put 15,000 people together in price hogs. One of the experienced NFO leaders who brings in groups of young people to see the NFO is Glenn Utley of Indiana, member of the National Board. The time is now to organize and the farmer has, not only has the right to organize and price his commodity, morally he is wrong if he does not put a just price, a cost of production plus a reasonable profit on that food because that is the freedom of this country and if he doesn't price it and stay in business, he is going to be one of the guilty ones of turning this over to the corporation. We've brought you conversations with some NFO leaders and with the young farmers and ranchers visiting NFO home office. Phil Allen for NFO News. And that for today is something to think about.